Well, this, these are some of my best friends, and none of them knows how to pronounce my name after all, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> it's not important. I love them anyway. Um, our text for today is Romans chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5. So Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance pro proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. May the Lord bless our time together. Uh, let us pray. Our Father, you are the Alpha and the Omega who declared the end from the beginning. Lord, you are the creator and sustainer of all creation. You alone are the source of every gift, the source of every blessing. We thank you, Father, for the privilege that it is to be able to come to you in prayer, to bring to you our petitions in our time of need. Father, there are many, many people among us who are going through very difficult times, whether it is sickness or grief due to the loss of a loved one, issues at home, issues at work or at school. There's loneliness and anxiety or just insecurity about the future. Lord, you know our hearts. You know what we need better than we do. So we ask you, Father, that, uh, that you would give us the strength and the faith and the trust that we need, the trust in you. Protect us and guide us through these times that you have chosen for us to live and allow us to remember that you're with us always, even to the end of the age. And for those who are going through happy and joyful times, times of peace, we ask you, Lord, that you will allow them to first and foremost acknowledge that uh, everything comes from your hand that it is you who has blessed us with, uh, with this tranquility and this peace that we enjoy. So Lord, we thank you for everything, and we ask for your blessing upon us this morning as we open your word and learn from it. And would you please remove all the distractions from our minds and our hearts so that we may focus entirely and solely on you. May this lesson be honoring to you and of profit to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. War is a horrible thing. It goes without saying. It is impossible to imagine for those of us who have been blessed with not having to partake in it. So in the fall of 2001, the TV series Band of Brothers gave us a little glimpse into some of the horrific yet heroic experiences of Major Richard Winters and the EC Company's 2nd Battalion of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division during World War II. Throughout their time on the battlefront, Major Winters and his men saw many of their closest friends, their brothers in arms, die in gruesome ways. They witnessed the vast destruction caused not only by the Allied, but also by the Axis forces. And throughout this TV series, we see that fear, chaos, anger, despair, and exhaustion were part of the daily lives of these men for a time that seemed like an eternity. And now, picture this. The final scene of the entire series happens in Austria. It's in a camp that the army had set up in a beautiful green valley surrounded by pristine mountains. And 13 of the original members of EC Company were playing a, on a baseball field next to an airstrip. And then in the background, there are soldiers watching them play. There are military jeeps, there's equipment, there's tents, and there's an airplane at a distance. And there's nothing but laughter and camaraderie and enjoyment on this beautiful scene in Austria. Major Winters smiles as he sees the faces of each and every one of his men playing America's favorite pastime, this, this game that we have been playing since the Civil War. 
And as he looks at them, a voiceover of Major Winter starts describing the whereabouts of each of the 15 original members of Easy Company who survived the war effort. Enter Major Winters and Captain Nixon, walking toward the baseball field with a very important announcement. This morning, President Truman received the unconditional surrender from the Japanese. The war is over. It is D-Day plus 434. Regardless of points, medals, or wounds, each man in the 101st Airborne Division would be going home. The soldiers look in disbelief. Some of them cheer, some of them smile. Some run back to their tents, some start walking slowly. But they're all getting ready for the imminent departure and return home. And as you would expect from a great and humble leader, Major Winters spoke about himself at the very end, only after he was done describing and speaking about his own men. And these were his words. I accepted the personal manager position at Nixon Nutrition Works until I was called back into the service in 1950 to train officers and rangers. I chose not to go to Korea. I had enough of war. I stayed around Hershey, Pennsylvania, finally finding a little farm, a little peaceful corner of the world where I still live today. There is not a day that goes by that I do not think of the men I served with that never got to enjoy the world without war. To add insult to injury, those who sadly died without Christ went from the horror of World War II to the horror of an eternity in hell. All men want peace. However, the reality is that men are at, in enmity with God. In the first two and a half chapters of this book of Romans, Paul tells us that it is sin that has made us enemies of God. Whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not, all of us, all of us here, have rebelled against God. Mankind is at war with God. And needless to say, this war is a war that, a, that man cannot win. Humanity is utterly incapable of reconciling with God. So what we need is a mediator. We need an intercessor with the authority, the power, the ability, and the willingness to restore a relationship with God Almighty. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. In our section here today, Paul assures us that only those who have trusted in Christ for their salvation can rest in the fact that they are now at peace with God. So let's start with verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a transitional phrase in which the adverb, therefore, connects chapter 5 with everything that Paul had been saying in the previous chapters about this doctrine of justification. In fact, this first half of verse 5, the phrase having been justified by faith, is a summary of the main idea of chapters 1 through 4. And before we continue, I would like to spend some time speaking about this doctrine of justification because it is an essential doctrine that must be understood by every believer. So let us start from the very beginning. Let us start with the question, why is it that all of us need to be justified? Why? Well, a couple of weeks ago, probably more than that, I was explaining during the Sunday school hour that when Adam ate the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, sin and death, both physical and spiritual, entered into the world. When Adam fell into sin, our fellowship with God was instantly destroyed. In a moment, it evaporated. Our fellowship turned into rebellion. Adam's fall opened an infinite chasm between God and man. And there is no technology, there is no philosophy, there is no human action that can bridge it. Sin did not only separate us from God, it also made us his enemies, deserving of his wrath. And there is nothing we can do to solve that problem. Sin is the reason, then, why there is no peace in the hearts of men. Sin brought death, and with it came chaos, fear, sorrow, and despair. And contrary to what the world wants you to believe, sin is not insignificant. Sin is a big deal. Sin cannot be dismissed. 
Sin cannot just be forgotten. It cannot be swept under the, under the rug and pretending that never even happened. Sin must be paid for, either by us or by someone else. And then, in fact, Paul will tell us later in chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death. That's how serious sin is. According to the world, there are many ways by which you might find happiness and peace. Some of these could be, for example, the accumulation of wealth. Money is going to make you happy. It's going to give you peace of mind. Participating in charitable activities, helping others, that's going to make you feel better. Eating right, or maybe going to therapy, or practicing med meditation, or many other things. There are all these activities that can give you peace, peace of mind. And there's nothing wrong with these uh, uh, activities, except, of course, that they are all temporal. Countless of people have spent their entire lives seeking happiness and peace without success. Why? Because they have seen and they have looked everywhere except for God. The Lord tells us that there is no peace for the wicked. Men will never find peace unless they are reconciled with God. The good news, the good news is that this is exactly what the Lord Jesus did for us. Those of us who have believed in Christ as our Lord and Savior have been permanently and irrevocably justified. Now, what is justification? Well, justification is a divine legal act of God by which a sinner is declared righteous by the imputation of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In other words, justification is God's act of pardoning sinners and accepting them as legally right with him. Justification happens in an instant, in the blink of an eye. This is a once and for all event. At the moment of faith, at the very second a person believes in Christ, God acquits them of all the charges and declares them righteous right there and then at that very moment. And something that must always be in our minds is that God declares us righteous not because we are innocent. That's not why he declares us righteous. We're, we're guilty. He declares us righteous because of what his son, Jesus Christ, did at the cross. That's why we are declared righteous. The Lord Jesus Christ did what we could not do for ourselves. Through his death on the cross, Jesus Christ satisfied the justice of God. He paid the infinite debt that we owed. The Lord Jesus paid the penalty of all of our sins, past, present, and future. All of it, it's paid for. He endured the wrath of God on our behalf. He took the punishment that was due to us. He took our place on the cross. Jesus came to die so that you and I could live. That's what he did. That's why we are declared righteous. And then, of course, as a result of our justification, the word with God is over. And now, all of us who have believed have peace and reconciliation with God. And this is the greatest peace of all. It is irrevocable. It is eternal. It is the present possession of those who believe. Meaning that you and I, who are saved, we enjoy that peace right here, right now, in Dallas, Texas. It is not in the future. It is not conditional. It is here and now. Peace with God cannot be earned by human merit. It cannot be achieved by our ingenuity. It cannot be found in a little corner of Hershey, Pennsylvania, or in any other physical place for that matter. Peace with God is only available through faith in Jesus Christ. In verse 2, Paul says that because of our reconciliation with the Father through our faith in Jesus Christ, we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Now, I am reading from the New American Standard Bible, and that translates this phrase, this Greek phrase, prosagogen eskeikamen, which means to obtain, uh, uh, they translate as obtained our introduction. If you have a New International Version, it would translate it as uh, gained access. And if you have an English standard, it would say obtain access. And, and none of these are bad translations. But in my opinion, these translations may lead to some confusion 
by leading people to believe that our access to the throne of grace, that our access to God is the result of something that we did. And, and as I mentioned before, we did not obtain anything. We did not gain anything. It was not us. It was Christ who did it all. So with that said and with that in mind, I think that a more specific translation is similar to what the King James Version says, which is this, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Now let me explain why I say this. The Greek word echo has more than 10 different meanings depending on different grammatical uh, uh, factors. But in the context of this verse, eskeikamen means to have been granted, or, or it means to enjoy something. And then we have this word uh, prosagogen, which appears only three times in the New Testament, twice in Ephesians and once here in Romans. And in every case, prosagogen means to have access to someone. So when you put this idea together with these uh, 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 meanings, what you have here is that this Greek phrase speaks of the believer's access to God through the faith that we have in Christ. Now let us remember that before we were justified, before our justification, before our salvation, we were separated from God. We were enemies of God deserving of his wrath. Now, obviously, if you're an enemy, this would completely prevent you from having access to the king of the universe. You cannot approach, approach God. You're an enemy. You cannot come. But when someone is justified, when someone is saved by faith in Christ, that person is immediately and forever reconciled with the Lord. You stop being an enemy of God, and you become not only a friend of God, but a child of God. We go from a stranger to a part of the family. And just like any other child, we have immediate access to our Father. Now, as many of you, I also worry about the direction of our country. I have many questions and concerns that I would like to share with the president of our, of our country in hopes that he may steer this country in the right direction. So I decided to take some action, and I gave him a call. So I took my phone. This is real. I took my phone and I said, hey Siri, call the president. And after a few seconds, I was immediately connected to an operator at the White House. If you do this, it will happen, I promise you. So I was connected to the, to the operator of the White House and I communicated to this lady that I wanted to talk to the president and she kindly transferred me to another person, another department, and this person's sole purpose is to take messages like mine and then transmit them to the appropriate department, which is in this case is the office of the president. So I expressed my concerns and I gave her my contact information, everything, so they can reach out whenever they have an answer for me, <laughs> wink. So <clears throat> in reality, the probability of me getting an actual response from the president of the United States is, is it's, it's zero percent. I mean, this is, is nothing. No doubt, of course, the, the, the president is, is, is far too busy to take a random call from a random guy in Texas that knows nothing about politics and economics. So the point is this. Our president is virtually unapproachable, but not our father in heaven. The creator of the universe knows each and every one of his children by name which is more than my mom can say because after 46 years, she can still not distinguish between me and my brother. She calls both names when he, she wants to talk to one of us. <laughs> but the Lord of the universe knows each and every one of his children by name. Through prayer, all of us who belong to Christ, we're able to approach the triune God of the universe. We can talk to him whenever we want to. We can reach him whenever we need to. God is never busy to hear our prayers. He's never out of reach. He's never surprised by our circumstances. God always listens to his children. He knows our thoughts. He knows our hearts. He's intimately involved in every aspect of our lives, however important, however mundane. He knows what's going on. He knows what we need, and he provides accordingly and abundantly. 
God is always near because he lives in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. There is nothing he does not know, and everything he does is for our good. You can be certain of that. What must be understood then is that every aspect of our salvation is solely the work of God. The forgiveness that we received, our righteousness in the eyes of God, the peace that we now enjoy and the access we have with God, all of this are blessings that come through our faith in Christ. These blessings are eternal and they cannot be lost. This means that we do not go from being saved to be unsaved and be saved again, depending on the circumstances. That's not how this works. Salvation cannot be lost. Christ's sacrifice on the cross is complete, is everlasting, and there is nothing you and I can add to it. So this is why we can be certain that we stand firmly and immovably in God's grace. And Paul tells us at the very end of verse 2, that this security gives us reason, reason to exult, reason to, in, to rejoice in hope of, of the glory of God. Every year, people hope for different things, right? Some hope to lose weight. Some hope for a mild summer. Some hope for the Cowboys to finally win the Super Bowl. And some of us hope for a white Christmas in Dallas. And sadly, most of these people, me included, end the year disappointed. This is what we would call everyday human hope. But this is not the hope that Paul is speaking about here. The Greek word elpis, which is translated in our scriptures, in our Bibles as hope, conveys the idea of looking forward to something with some reason for confidence, respecting fulfillment. So what this means is that Christian hope is a confident expectation. We are certain that in his time, God will fulfill his promises. And one of the promises that all Christians have received is that one day we will not only see and experience God's glory, we will also partake in it. That is a promise that God has made. Believers will share God's glory because we are predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, Romans 8, 29. That is why we will partake of his glory. And Paul tells us that we must exult in this hope. We must boast in the certainty of our present and our future salvation. Now, I realize that boasting is a very strong word. In fact, Webster defines it as expressing excessive pride or to speak with excessive pride. So, children, adults, we should never be boasting about our own accomplishment. It's, it's, it's inappropriate. It's, it's wrong. However, in this case, it is totally appropriate. And it is even required because we are boasting in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This boasting is actually pleasing and honoring to God because it demonstrates that we believe in him and that we trust that he will fulfill all the promises that he himself made in his written word, the Bible. Our certainty, our security is, of course, not in ourselves. It's not in our faith or on, or on how faithful we are. Our confidence is in God alone. He did it all. Paul continues in, verse, in the first uh, uh, half of verse 3, saying that we not only rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, but we also exult in our tribulations. We rejoice in our sufferings. Now, at first glance, if you have never read this, this verse before, or it has never been explained, this seems like a very shocking statement. How is it possible to exult in our sufferings? Are you, are you out of your mind? Do you know what I'm going through? How can suffering be regarded as a blessing? I am in pain here. Well, allow me to explain. This is not a masochistic statement in which Paul is asking us to rejoice in pain and suffering. That's not what he's saying. Few knew better than Paul that suffering is very unpleasant and there is absolutely no pleasure in pain. 
But Paul is not asking us to rejoice in the troubles themselves. What Paul is asking us to do is to rejoice in the midst of suffering, to rejoice while we are going through painful situations. And you're going to say, what? How, how would I do that and why would I do such thing? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you why. Our Father is a loving Father. And he's thoroughly aware of everything that happens in the lives of each and every one of us. We already discussed this. He's a gracious and merciful and generous God who's always seeking to bless those who belong to him. Therefore, all of our tribulations, all of our sufferings in this life have a reason, have a purpose. And God uses these painful and unpleasant experiences to sanctify us to change us and make us more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is through our pain and through our suffering that God prepares his children to serve the world and to serve one another. As I was saying, there's a purpose, there's a reason for this. This is how God prepares his people to minister to others who are going through the same painful experiences. Our pain, our suffering are not in vain, they have a divine purpose. Then Paul tells us in the second half of verse 3 that tribulation brings about perseverance. In other words, our pain and our suffering produce in us patience and ability to endure hardship in this hostile and evil world system. The Lord Jesus Christ promised that in this world we will have tribulation, but he didn't leave us at that. He said, for, uh, uh, um, in this world you will have tribulation, but be encouraged. I have overcome the world. Words more, words less, but that's what he's saying. Paul continues in verse 4, saying that perseverance results in proven character, and proven character, hope. So just as a goldsmith uses intense heat to med- melt gold in order to remove all the f- uh, physical impurities of it, so does God use his tribulations to cleanse his children from spiritual impurities. And the result is a proven character that has successfully endured the fiery test. This is how God sanctifies his people. This is how he makes us spiritually strong. This is how he strengthens our spiritual character. Now think for a moment about Major Winters and the men of Easy Company. They became American heroes by enduring and persevering through terrible, horrible trials, not through peace and comfort back at home. These terrible experiences shaped them. They changed them into tough men that would not shy away easily from trouble in the future. He made them leaders, strong leaders out of this nightmare that they had to go through. And the same thing is for all of us here, moms and dads. One day we will have to lead our families through difficult times in, in our lives. They're going, our children are going to look forward to us for protection and guidance. We need to be ready. Tribulation is coming. It is a promise. This is how the Lord makes us able to endure And then the result of perseverance, of course, is proven character. The believer who responds to this suffering with a proper attitude, which is faith, will find that his or her hope has been strengthened. Contrary to what the world might tell you, tribulations will not threaten or weaken our hope. That's not what's going to happen. On the contrary, tribulations will increase our certainty in that hope. Why? Well, because hope is like our muscles. They become weak when they're not used and become strong when they're exercised regularly. So every time a believer goes through a time of testing, his or her faith is is exercised and and therefore is strengthened. And then as a result of this, our confidence in God's ability and willingness to bring us through these tribulations leads us to an even greater hope for the future. That's how this works. As I mentioned in the beginning of this lesson, Christian hope is not just superficial optimism like someone might have when they're hoping for the Cowboys to win the Super Bowl. This, this is not, that's not at all. Our hope is the confident assurance that God will surely fulfill everything he promised. Our hope is not an illusion. Our hope is not just mere optimism. 
It is not wishful thinking. Paul knew that. So in verse 5, he reassures us that our hope is real. He said in verse 5, And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. When Paul speaks about the love of God, He's not referring to our love for God. If he was talking about our love for God, there would be no reason to be assured. Actually, we would have every reason to be concerned. We have no basis for assurance in that way. Why? Well, because you need to think about how all of us are, whether we say it or not, whether we admit it or not. Our love for one another whether it is your wife or your children, your relatives or your friends, our love for one another is, is often conditional and it changes depending on the circumstances, right? So for example, a guy might say, hey, listen, sweetheart, I'm, I want to love you. As long as the circumstances are right, as long as the time is right, I'm, I'm going to love you. I love you. And then she might respond, well, I, I would love you, sure, as long as you won't do what I want you to do. So this is, of course, just for illustration purposes, and there has no basis on reality, but this is how we operate. <laughs> when, we, when we do what each other wants, wants us to do, you know, we are at peace, but, but don't cross me, because if you do, then, then you're in the doghouse, and it's an up and down with our love relationships. So that's how we are, but this is not at all what Paul has in mind here. Instead, what Paul is speaking about here is the love that God has for us. God's love is infinite. It is unconditional, unconditional and unchangeable. Believers will not experience shame because the love of God has been poured into their hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now notice in this phrase that God is not holding back. He's not giving you little by little a little taste of his love, you know, like uh, one piece at the time. His love is not being dispensed in little increments. Instead, God's love is given freely, abundantly, and lavishly. God's love for us flows like a river on a, of an immeasurable torrent straight into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, that at the moment of faith, at the moment of faith in Christ, the believer is sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit is a gift given by God and he was given to us as a pledge for the future inheritance in glory. Therefore, when you think about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you cannot think but how marvelous a testimony of God's love for us this is. And it is through the Holy Spirit that believers are able to experience the love of God in their hearts. Now, perhaps you are here today with an aching heart and a tired mind wondering, you know, after all I've been going through, how can I know for sure that God really loves me? How can I be sure that one day I will meet him in heaven because I am spent, I am hurt, I need some encouragement? Well, if you're in that position here today, I would say to you one thing, something that the Lord repeats constantly through the scriptures. Remember, remember. First, remember the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. The one true God of the universe loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross to pay for all of your sins. And if you believe in him, you shall not perish. Instead, you will receive eternal life. The second thing that I want you to remember is what we just discussed about the gift that you have received in the form of the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit will, you, will be with you forever. And he will ensure that you're never lost and you're never destitute. That's what Dan Duncan was talking about last week. He's not going to leave us as orphans. He's not going to leave you out to your fate. He is with you forever. And lastly, you need to remember the scriptures. For it is there that God revealed himself to us. And when you read through God's word, you will find that you are not alone and hopeless. This is what Mark Brunger was reminding us last week. I think it was last week or a couple of weeks ago about knowing God. How do you know God? Through the reading of his word. That's how you know what he promised. That's how you know what he did. That's how you, how you know who he is through the scriptures. And this is how you know that you're not alone and hopeless. This is how you know that God knows you by name, that he knows exactly how many hairs you have on your head. This sounds ridiculous, but this is straight from scripture. He knows what you're feeling. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're going through. He's not oblivious. God is with his children now and always. And there is nothing his mind does not know. There is nothing his eyes do not see. And there is nothing his, eyes, his ears cannot hear. So take courage. This is the God that we serve. This is our Father in heaven. God is faithful. And he will strengthen you and protect you in your time of need. He knows but if you're here without Christ, if you're here without Christ, you have no peace. You are still at war with God. You're an enemy of God that is deserving of the fullness of his wrath. God promised in the scriptures that those who stand against him will experience eternal torment and destruction in hell. And unlike major winters and the easy company, there are no allies to support you. There is no band of brothers to fight alongside you. If you are without Christ on this spiritual battlefield, you face the almighty God of creation all alone. However, the good news is that this horrible reality can change in a moment when you trust in Christ for your salvation and the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus Christ is the only hope that you find, that you have to find eternal peace and reconciliation with the Father. It is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. So believe in him while there is still time and come to Christ now and let this be the day of your salvation. Now, Josh, are you playing for us? Thank you. So if we would, would, would mind, may you stand please and sing number 27. In the Songs of Praise, 27. Our Father in heaven, you are the almighty sovereign of all creation, perfect in every way. We acknowledge our sin. We are fallen creatures who have fallen short of your glory, and we are completely unworthy of your favor. And yet, in your infinite grace and mercy, you decided to love us and to rescue us from the slavery of sin and the power of death. We thank you, Lord, for everything you have done for us, especially for sending your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. We thank you that in him we have forgiveness and reconciliation, peace, and eternal life. And it is in his name we pray. Amen.